love lives here. So this year here at Centers for Spiritual Living Worldwide, we are working with the theme of timeless wisdom, evolutionary vision. And this month we are working with a theme of one journey, many paths. And it is my delight and joy to share with you a friend and a colleague, Lydia Joy Ayers. She was part of the team, the 2021 Global Themes team uh, for this year's themes. And she has she's returning to us um, on the team for next year as well. So it is a delight and a joy to work with this beautiful, beautiful, radiant being. So Lydia Joy, Ayers is a practitioner, a ministerial intern, and a senior student at both Holmes Institute and the CSL School of Spiritual Leadership in San Diego. She is a regeneration program member working alongside other next generation ministerial students and members of our movement to revitalize and inspire up and coming leadership within Centers for Spiritual Living. Lydia Joy is a registered nurse by day and combines supporting people's bodies with supporting their souls. She is building a ministry of peace, compassion, and presence through chaplaincy and community-based grassroots inspiration. What I can tell you about Lydia Joy is don't be deceived by what you might think of as her youth. She has got a deep, deep, well of wisdom within her and such a beautiful mystical consciousness. And I am over the moon excited to share her with you, my beloved community, Riverside Center for Spiritual Living. Please give a warm, warm welcome to soon to be Reverend Lydia Joy Ayers. Lydia Joy, welcome. Thank you, Reverend Jeff. And thank you all of you for having me. I have to say it's, um, with every passing year, it's more and more delightful to hear myself referred to as youthful, so I'll take it for as long as I can get it. And Reverend Jeffrey has already introduced our year and monthly theme. Today we are talking about the journey to freedom. And I think it's important to acknowledge that as we talk about the journey to freedom today, we are doing so on the last Sunday of Black History Month. So I don't want that to go unaddressed, and I am certain that you've been speaking about Black History Month and been engaging with Black History Month throughout February as part of your practice. We will hear from some Black voices in my talk um, through some of the examples that I've been able to find for you and that I'm really excited to share with you. Just a sort of quick overview of what I'll be talking about this morning. We are talking about freedom, and this is a, a big, big concept. So we'll break it down into three sort of categories. The first is our own individual consciousness and really reminding us of the spiritual truth of who we are and what we are. We'll move from there into an experience of freedom and spirit beyond thinking about it, but really moving into feeling the divine and being with the divine right here, as I know that you have been doing all month. And then finally, we'll talk a little about taking these truths and taking this feeling and using that to truly create a world that works for everyone. I want to begin by reminding or sharing with many of you a phrase um, from our What We Believe statements. Here at Centers for Spiritual Living, we have several lovely documents and um, books and works by Ernest Holmes, the founder of our philosophy, and one of his creations is this short little document called What We Believe that really gets at the heart of our teaching. And in that statement, nearly 100 years ago, he said, we believe the ultimate goal of life is to be a complete freedom from all discord of any nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. A complete freedom from all discord of every nature. I really love this statement, and I think that it's important to begin with because w the focus on attaining this goal by all is going to be important, is important. It's easy for us in Centers for Spiritual Living, something that we do really well is 
use our minds. We are called science of mind. We like to use our minds. We like to think. We like to talk about principle and consciousness. And it's important for us to remember where we come from and also pull that into the now and pull that into a felt experience, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But as we do so, we'll keep this at heart that the goal of freedom is sure to be attained by all. And another quote that I'm sure many of you know is that we are not all free if all of us are not free. So how can the goal of freedom be attained by all when there are some people not having the experience of freedom, not having an experience of liberation, not having an experience of being and doing and manifesting the life that they want to have? I find that we're sometimes out of harmony with spiritual law when we de deny the internal godness and the divinity in others, whether in practice or just in thought. And I want to back up a little bit and talk about the divinity in others. Frances so beautifully worked this into her prayer. But we know as one of the essential truths and one of the foundations upon which we build our philosophy is that God is all there is, that there is only ever one thing happening which is the divine expressing itself right here and now the way that it can. And just to back up a little bit even further, for those of you who've taken foundations, you'll remember our teaching symbol. For those of you who've even entered any of our sanctuaries, you'll be aware of the circle with a V in it. This really, this is emblematic of God being everything. And there's sort of the conceptual God, the mental God, the God that is everything, that is freedom and joy and harmony and peace and truth. And there's the manifestation of it, which is what we see right here and now, which is the physicalness of my body and the physicalness of each of you and the day-to-day -day workings of our lives. And these day-to-day -day workings of our lives are pulled into being by our thoughts. Our thoughts connect us right back to God. We are really just part of God showing up in a different way. One of my favorite teaching metaphors is to simply use silly putty and squish it. You can squish silly putty into any shape that you like, and it's still silly putty. We are shaped the way that we are, and ultimately at our truth, at the core of us, we are part of the divine. Excuse me. And this divine is unchangeable. This divine is always there. And this divine is experiences like peace and freedom and harmony and love and joy and all goodness and all godness. However, the way that that shows up in our lives is dependent on thought, is dependent on our intention, is dependent on how we show up to things. Many of you who've taken foundations will be familiar with the, the seed, the soil, and the plant. The thoughts that we put into the world, the thoughts that we put out with our minds show up as real things. Just like if I planted a carrot seed in the ground, I would likely get a carrot unless I overwater it, which I'm very likely to do. But it would try to be a carrot. Um, the same way our thoughts sort of create our reality and our thoughts, our consciousness is where we need to begin in working toward freedom, in working toward peace, either for ourselves or for everyone else. Because as we've already touched upon this morning, all of us aren't free. Until all of us are free, none of us are free, excuse me. So if we want our own freedom, even if I particularly feel free in my life, if someone else is free, I cannot entirely be free. And there are sort of two aspects of this statement. One is a very social justice oriented way of taking it, a very compassionate outlook. How could I ever feel free if I see someone in bondage? How could I ever feel free if I see someone in pain? And this is a wonderful thing. And that is a great thing about human nature. And I don't mean to dismiss it at all. I myself am very moved by this kind of compassion and I'm very distressed to think that other folks are not experiencing freedom and liberty. However, if we wanna take it a little further, we can also see that this is a mental concept. This is an expression of the creative process of God. 
pulling itself out from our thoughts and into the world. If one person isn't free, if one group of people aren't free, if one group of people aren't liberated, neither can I be because unfreedom and unliberation and bondage and pain are what are swirling around in the same thing I'm made of. It's all the same silly putty, right? So if pain is in the silly putty, pain is going to come out in me. Pain is going to come out in the world. So what we can work to do is eliminate that in the first place. Take it out of the equation of the silly putty. Because bondage isn't God. We know this. Freedom is God. Liberation is God. Liberation is the divine. What happens is we put our limited thinking on it, and then it shows up in limited ways. So if we change our limited thinking, we change those limited ways that it shows up. One thing that I really love I'm stealing this from another minister who is up in Fallbrook, Reverend Guy Williams. He likes to talk about the Bible, and he always says, the Bible begins with, in the beginning God spoke, let there be light, and all the rest is commentary. And I feel that that is true probably about the Bible and certainly about our lives. We are God walking around in human form, and all the rest is commentary. Any pain, any bondage, anything else isn't God. It's just the comments that we're putting on God. It's the ideas that we're putting on God. But the eternal within us, the divine showing itself as us, is eternal and changeless. It needs only be recognized and liberated. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite stories from the Odyssey, because before I was a nursing student, before I was a ministerial student, I was a nursing student, and before I was a nursing student, I was a lit student. So I really like really old, dusty literature like the Odyssey. I'm not going to repeat the whole thing for you, even though I would like to. But toward the end of the Odyssey, for those of you unfamiliar with the story, Odysseus, our main character, has been away from home for around 20 years, first fighting in a war and then having all sorts of misadventures that brought him further and further away from home, as tends to happen in Greek literature. He's close to home. He's about to get back. And his wife has had to host many, many suitors who want to marry her um, because it's assumed that Odysseus is dead. So their home is full of suitors who are essentially camping out and abusing for Penelope's hospitality because in ancient Greek times, you really couldn't turn someone away. That's a whole part of the story. Um, So she's just sort of besought upon and (laughs) stuck with all of these people around and Odysseus wants to go home and cast them all out of his home, but he's not quite free to do so because They outnumber him, and the thought is they might kill him. And also, that's just not how it works in Greek mythology. It has to be a little more complicated than that. So he's speaking with the goddess Athena, because in Greek mythology, we get to speak with goddesses every day. And they hatch this plan to disguise him. He'll go in looking entirely different than he normally looks. Hopefully, no one will recognize him, not even his wife. And he'll be able to prove that he truly is Odysseus and that this is his home and therefore the suitors will all have to leave. Before he went away 20 years ago or so for this war, he had a very, very loyal dog named Argos. This dog is still living, I'm sure very old, maybe his joints hurt, but he's still living. And when Odysseus walks in in his disguise, Argos lying in the corner, raises his head and wags his tail, recognizing his master. And I love this story for a lot of reasons. But a point here that I think is really important is that no matter how far our appearances change at our core, we are changeless. And the God within us will always be recognized by God and be recognizable to God. The connection with the divine, the connection that Odysseus had with his dog could be a metaphor for our connection with the divine. No matter how my external life looks, I am still God's. I am still part of the divine. I am still part of this experience. And no matter how it looks, I can recognize the divine when I see it. I can recognize that something else is possible. And this leads us into the second point I really want to make after I take a sip of water. Excuse me. So this is leading into the second point that I'd like to make, which ties us into prayer. And the type of prayer that we specifically do here in Centers for Spiritual Living, sometimes we call it spiritual mind treatment. Sometimes we call it affirmative prayer. As many of you are familiar, it's a five-step process 
The first two steps are called recognition and unification. And these words are referencing our recognition of the divine, our unification with the divine. And I love it that we start with just recognizing. Nothing has to happen. Nothing has to be plugged in. We simply have to recognize it, just like Argos recognizes Odysseus, just like God looking around can recognize God being right there. And this is the powerful part of our prayer. This is where we remember who and what we are. We come aligned, as Frances so beautifully demonstrated earlier in her prayer, we come aligned with all that is God, including freedom, including liberation, including joy and beauty and peace and all of it. And then the second step is to remember our unity with it. Again, it's not to switch any, flip any sort of switch, sorry. It's to become reminded of our unification. We don't have to make it happen. We just have to remember that it is. So if God is everything, there's only one silly putty then this little squishy part of the silly putty that I call me has to be part of that. There's no way it can't. And so the experience of freedom can be right here. The experience of liberation, the experience of joy, the experience of whatever it is that we want or need can happen right here. And when I'm praying for myself or for someone else, this is the part where my body really starts to get involved where it stops being something that I'm thinking about or something that I read in the Science of Mind text or something that someone else said and it sounded really good, so I want to try and remember it and say it like that too. It starts just coming through me. I know that a few weeks ago, Reverend Jeffries spoke to you about the three different faces of God, and one of those faces is very, very intimate and very personal and expresses itself sort of through and as us all at once. This is what's happening, and this is where we can get with prayer. And what's really important, what Ernest Holmes said even when he was teaching about prayer, is that the words aren't what makes the prayer work. It's the feeling. The words are there to get us to the feeling. If I am praying for freedom, if I am praying for liberation, if I am praying for peace, if I am praying for whatever, the idea of all of those words is to bring me to an experience of it, because just like if I plant a carrot seed, I'll get a carrot. If I plant the seed of joy, if I plant the seed of liberation, if I plant the seed of freedom, freedom will show up. And the more of us are planting seeds of freedom, the more freedom shows up for ourselves and for the world. Because remember, it's all just the same one blob of silly putty. Putting more freedom into it means there's more freedom for everyone. I want to talk a little about the title being Journey to Freedom, not Arrival to freedom. I don't know if freedom is a destination where we can ever arrive. I don't know if this will ever be fully complete. I sincerely doubt it. Because the purpose of all of this is to experience, is to play, is to keep learning, is to keep growing, is to keep having more and more and more of the divine expressing itself through us. So this isn't a job that's ever done. Just like Black History is never over, just like Black History Month doesn't end, I suppose on the calendar it ends tomorrow, but the importance of Black History doesn't end tomorrow. The importance of liberating our brothers and sisters who are having experiences of pain and bondage doesn't end when the clock strikes midnight. Freedom is not someplace we'll suddenly arrive and the work is done. The process is what's important. The journey is what's important. And the journey is where we learn and grow. When we become really committed to the thought of an arrival, excuse me, the thought of an end destination here, we start limiting the divine. We start limiting the experience that we can be having. We say, okay, this is exactly what we wanted, so we are not going to keep planting. I got all of the carrots I needed this year, so why plant another carrot? Well, because I might need them next year. Other people might need carrots. Because if I don't plant, then what else will I do with myself? There are plenty of ways to take that. But what's really important, again, to emphasize, is that this is a continuous journey. Life moves in a continuous upward spiral. And as we all know and as we have all heard, we are constantly spiraling back to the same thing to learn deeper and deeper truths 
and bigger and bigger ways of being to move nearer and nearer to an experience of the fullness of the divine. So don't get bogged down in thinking about freedom, but rather feeling it. And if we're thinking about freedom all the time, then we might have an idea of what that will look like, and that's fine. And in your own visualization work, it's great to have an idea of what something looks like. But we like to leave room for something else too. Often in my prayers, I'll say this or something better, this or something bigger. Allowing the divine to keep flowing, to keep growing, to keep showing up the way that it wants to. <clears throat> it's also important to note that freedom doesn't only exist in the mind. It's all well and good to think about the things you'd like to do. But to merely be able to think and dream of freedom is not liberty. We have to be able to free to move about the cabin of our lives the way that we want to, and the way that the divine is calling us, or else we aren't free. And as I was thinking about this through the week and reading and really focusing on reading experiences of our Black friends and of our Black community, I came ac across this quote by Lonnie G. Bunch III who is the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He was talking about traveling with his family in the Green Book days. And for those of you who know, who don't know what the Green Book days were, before civil rights, before the civil rights movement in the 60s, Jim Crow laws varied wildly from city to city and state to state. So there were published books called the Green Book that you could order that gave you all of the laws and marked places where it was safe to travel as a black person and where it wasn't so that black people going to visit their friends or family or simply have a vacation would know what towns were safe to stop in what restaurants were safe to eat at what gas stations were safe and plan their routes accordingly so Lonnie G Bunch the third was talking about this and said that the biggest takeaway from this experience and what this means to him or what this left him with was the thought of am I going to have the experience that I want, which is to be free of race and enjoy this moment? Or is race going to tap me on the shoulder? And I think that this could be true of anything. I'm talking about race because it's Black History Month and because it's important in our culture at this time. But that is what freedom is. Freedom is being, is not having something to tap you on the shoulder when you're trying to be in a moment, when you're enjoying a moment, when you're going about your life and not having some fear looming over your head of what those consequences could be, whether they are as dire as they were for Lonnie and his family in the Green Book days, or whether it's as simple as how much stress am I gonna put on myself today? This reminded me also of some words from Reverend Dr. David Alexander, who is a Centers for Spiritual Living minister himself, who said, the proper application of science of mind principles can give you a life of freedom. However, the principles cannot take you any further than the bondage experience of the least of these. We are, after all, one body. Therefore, for a world of true freedom, let us work to create conditions of mass liberation for all of our neighbors as well as ourselves. Same silly putty, right? The same experience for all of us. We're all living and expressing what it is that everyone accumulates and puts into the world. And so even if I want to work for freedom for myself, I must work for freedom for others. Out of compassion, yes, and also out of sheer mechanics. This is the way that it works. If everyone else is not free, we cannot all be free. In the book, The Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes states, there is a tendency on the part of all of us to reproduce the accumulated subjective experiences of the human race. There are a lot of names that we use for this tendency, and they're not worth going into now. But it is important, I think, to remember that in the case of Black folks in America, the oppression that they experience is the result of collective thinking. And collectively, it is our work to undo it. None of us can be free until we all are. And this is where we move from feeling the experience of freedom. First, we thought about it, then we start to feel it. 
into pushing it out into the world, into really helping to create an experience of freedom, create an experience of liberation, create an experience where everyone is free to do as they like when they like. In our global vision statements at Centers for Spiritual Living, we say that we envision a world where each and every person has enough food, a home, a sense of belonging, a world of peace and harmony, enfranchisement and justice. And this necessarily includes conversations, mental shifts, and tangible action to create harmony for, to enfranchise, and to provide justice to our Black community members and everyone. If what we truly want to do is create a world of more harmony, if we want to, if what we want to do is feel and experience more and more and more and more of the divine here and now, always and forever, through all of our experiences, both individually and collectively, we must focus on uplifting those who have been downtrodden and liberating those who are in more bondage than we are, than we are, and providing justice where it hasn't been. And in enfranchisement, I love that we include this word, enfolding them in the community, bringing people in who have otherwise been cast out, who have otherwise been treated as not enough, because what we know going all the way back to Odysseus and Argos, is that the divine is in them just as the divine is in me and you and everyone, and that divinity recognizes one another. And so what is important is that we create a community, that we create a world that encourages us to recognize the divinity in one another, that makes the disguise a little bit less, and to create in ourselves that awareness that deep, deep connection like Odysseus has with his dog so that you could walk in in a disguise and I know it's you. Who do you think you're kidding here? I know that you're the divine showing up. I know that you're spirit cloaked in a skeleton and flesh. How could I treat you any differently? How could I see any differently? Because I know my own connection to spirit and that connection to spirit recognizes it in each of you and recognizes it in all of our communities. And so Black History Month can and must extend beyond February. And the journey to freedom doesn't have a destination. Because as we work to liberate more and more, we feel more and more liberation. We feel more and more freedom, both in ourselves and in our communities. This isn't about awareness. I think we're all pretty aware at this point of changes that need to happen. So it's time for action in both mental work and daily life. That can look a lot of ways. Ernest Holmes, I believe, said, treat and move your feet. So we can pray for, we can mentally know liberation. We can mentally know states of freedom. We can mentally know peace and harmony. We can move to an experience of feeling it for ourselves, of remembering that I am part of universal peace and harmony, and so is everyone else, and then acting accordingly. This is how we use our principles and spiritual practices to envision and actively create a world that works for everyone. I'd like to close by reading to you a benediction from Bishop Woody White of the United Methodist Church. And now may the Lord torment you. May the Lord keep before you the faces of the hungry, the lonely, the rejected and the despised. May the Lord afflict you with pain for the hurt, the wounded, the oppressed, the abused, the victims of violence. May God grace you with agony, a burning thirst for justice and righteousness. May the Lord give you courage and strength and compassion to make ours a better world, to make your community a better community, to make your church a better church. May you do your best to make it so. And after you have done your best, may the Lord grant you peace. Please join me in prayer. (sighs) And so knowing as we do that God is all there is, that there is one power and one presence, one peace and one freedom, which is everything. All that is. 
that there is one divine silly putty or divine thread or divine sea stretching itself out beyond the limits and stretches of my imagination, stretching itself out beyond the limits of consciousness, simply being itself, simply being all that is, and pulling itself down into this moment. I know that if this is the only thing that this is, then I am part of this divine. Then where I stand is where the divine stands as me, speaking as me, breathing as me, moving as me. And if this is true for me, then this must be true for each of us gathered here and all beings everywhere. That the divine stretches itself out beyond the limitless reaches of space and compresses itself down into the spaces between the molecules in each of our cells. Being everywhere all the time and bringing with it all of itself, all freedom, all joy, all love, all peace, all liberation, all truth. And so I know that this freedom is manifesting itself here and now and always and forever. I know that whatever pain of agony, whatever oppression, whatever abuse, whatever violence happens as it is healed in me, so it is healed in the world. And so I know that any anger, any fear, any dissolution, any doubt, any disenfranchisement is allowed to fall away. And instead, what happens is God rushes in, recognizing itself. Being with itself, holding and tending and befriending itself. And that as we each turn toward each other, as we each turn toward creating a world that works for all of us, so God turns to each of us. So the world becomes bigger and brighter. So the work becomes bigger and brighter and delightful and fun and perfect. And in all of it, I know that freedom and liberation and joy reign. And I know that all people who are oppressed are allowed to be uplifted, are allowed to uplift themselves, are allowed to uplift others, are able to step into the fold and be a part of the one, as they always have been. I allow all illusions otherwise to just fade away. I know that the divine says that this is true. I know that this is the way that it is working. Because there is only God, and God is only saying yes, and God is only free and perfect and whole and great. And so it is with great gratitude that I know this truth, that I speak this word, that I know the freedom and liberation and joy and peace upon each of us. And so it is. Love